Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar dedicated to life and death of claims. Here the goal is really to understand and manage the exposure and also to look at different insurance products which could help you to cover also be it your firm or yourself if you're an independent director. Here I wanted really to thank Anne, Antoine and Emmanuel for accepting this challenge and also working on this nice topic which was a little bit underrepresented within the association which will also be very nice to let's say deep dive further uh, over further sessions also in the future. Uh, here, uh, the first idea was really to better understand what is a claim, who is behind a claim, and certainly also sources and types of damages. I think that you will see with those different slides that were prepared by our panelists that they uh, really have uh, proposed a nice perspective on those, will give you all the right explanations, and based on that also certainly do not hesitate to ask all your questions via the Q&A or the chat uh, function. Uh, another a nice element is also to, to better understand how you could protect yourself. So here, first of all, you have, as usual, the best practices, good governance, etc., but also a presentation of different available products uh, and also depending on some risks. So that's also quite uh, interesting for, for your position right now. And uh, in the end, uh, I personally found that very interesting. It's to also understand the entire life cycle uh, of, of a claim and how that is being treated. And finally, uh, by, because you know that's all kind of sometimes theoretical, not in this case here, we'd like to finish with great examples. And Emmanuel on that one will then also help us out. And so without further ado, let's pass on then to Anne, who will then introduce herself, plus also then uh, the others will do the same uh, speakers, and then afterwards uh, discuss that. And uh, we will certainly see you soon again to discuss further insurance topics. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anne Clément. I'm working for Aon for five, six years now. And um, I'm a financial lines insurance specialist. Financial lines, this is a DNO, PI, uh, professional indemnity, cyber, employment practice, liability, fraud, etc. Uh, um, I have a 30 years experience in this matter. Now, uh, Antoine, your turn, please. Hi, so and my name is, uh, yes, my name is Antoine Rayet. I'm head of dispute resolution at CMS uh, Luxembourg. Um, I have 10 years experience in the field uh, and I deal um, a, a lot with corporate uh, disputes, including in a, in a fund, investment fund, context um, and uh, the the subject we're talking today has a have a particular interest uh, because I, I've been assisting directors in their claims uh, um, for for quite a, some time now and uh, it's uh, it's problematic that uh, that uh, that I like particularly Emmanuel I guess the the turn is mine thank you um, Anna and Antoine I'm Emmanuel Bega I am a partner with a PSF called uh, ME Business Solutions, MEBS. We are specialized in providing independent non-executive directors to uh, financial institutions. And I will testify on um, claims, how to handle them, and what the shortcomings could be with handling claims. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. I will now share the slides. Um, the idea of this presentation, as Stefan mentioned, is to, to, to adopt a chronological uh, order, and we have kind of personified claims as, as persons, um, and we're studying them from their birth to throughout their life and up to their end or their, their death. So first, the first question that comes to mind is, if I manage, yes. Where do they come from? So it's a bit like babies. You have to wonder where claims come from. I think uh, one misconception that uh, some professionals can have is that as a director, I'm liable if I breach my duty, if and only if I breach my duty towards my company because I have fiduciary duties to my company. It is true that this is the main, uh, theoretically, this is the main source of claim because the main liability as a director is towards your company. However, in practice, we see that this is quite a huge misconception and that as a director, you're facing claims from very, from, from very various sources. So we've listed the most typical ones here. The first one is the regulator. 
because your directors or uh, you you you're working in the context of a, in the financial business. There's a, of course a lot of regulation, a lot of obligation uh, imposed upon directors, and those regulations they are sanctioned by administrative fines, by a lot of various sanctions. Uh, apart from regulators, mainly the DCSSF, uh, you have also government agencies, for example, the CNPD, in terms of data protection, but there can be others that, that, that are relevant. Another huge source for directors or tax authorities, and we'll see that the, the tax liability risk is, is pretty strong once the company is in enters bankruptcy. Uh, you have judicial authorities um, that is claims, of course, mostly in, in, the, in the criminal sense, where you would have um, the police uh, coming <laughs> within your premises. It can be uh, for various reasons. It can be because you've done something wrong, but as we perhaps will discuss with Emmanuel, sometimes it may be that you've done nothing wrong, uh, but your name maybe came up uh, the name of your company came up in an investigation and suddenly you have the police within your premises and you have to handle them for a, an entire day or maybe sometimes two days. Um, then we have NGOs, so non-governmental uh, organizations. Um, it's a subject that is increasing in Luxembourg because, well, the more you extend uh, the notion of corporate interest, what what Co what is the corporate in interest, the more you extend the notion of what directors should do when they consider how to best act in the company's interests. And so we see a lot of, uh, well, a main subject will be greenwashing claims, for example, or um, uh, breaches of uh, environmental, or damages to the environment, uh, or consumer uh, class actions. Uh, so. In, in that context, you will more, you're more likely to face uh, claims from NGOs. And then you have some more classical um, sources of claims, which are shareholders, investors, former directors. That is something that can be sometimes a bit uh, overseen is uh, when you have a director that is removed and he's really unhappy about his removal. Uh, he might try to bring claims all over against the company, against the current uh, directors, against everybody. Um, then you have lenders, service providers, and employees. Now that we have some view of where the claims come from, i.e. potentially everywhere, which can be seem a bit frightening, um, the question is, what, what is the source of damages, i.e. What, what is legally or factually uh, the, the, the events that will trigger uh, the claim. The main one, as I said, as a director, you have a fiduciary duty towards your company. So if you don't act in the best interest of the company, you may be found liable. We will not enter here into the details, the specific regimes for faute de gestion, breach of the articles or breach of the Companies Act. This is a separate subject on director's liability. Uh, but of course, there, there are main sources of claims. Uh, but this is, these are the most obvious ones. Uh, the, the less obvious ones can be simply you acting on behalf of the company, breaching the law or regulations to which your company is subject to. Then this tax, tax liability, again, not a subject we'll address uh, here in detail, the, the, the regime itself, but it's of course a great source of liability, especially when the company enters bankruptcy. Breach of contract. Breach of contract. If you're a director of, your, of a company and the company is found to have breached the contract because of you and the company is ordered to pay damages because of that breach of contract, if you, as a director, you took the decision and you expose your company to uh, being found liable, well, potentially this can have an impact on your own liability as director because perhaps it can be it can constitute a, a breach of your own fiduciary duty. So even when considering um, how your company handles its own contracts, you must uh, you must really think, well, um, how does that impact my own liability as a director? And then uh, a quite typical uh, source of damages that we've identified and particularly for that presentation is NAV calculation error. 
I will uh, let Anne speak a bit more about some sources of damages that she, 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 she has seen personally and which are even more uncommon. Thanks, Antoine. Yes, uh, I would like to say that directors are also liable when they make a data breach because everybody uh, must um, be compliant with GDPR. Um, oh, sorry. What's... Could you please? Uh, thank you. No, here. Thank you. Uh, when there is a cyber attack, a director or well, directors could be also li liable for malware or phishing, with, which which could arise in their IT. Um, they also could be um, liable for employment practices, such as uh, such as harassment and discrimination. And there are other um, examples I will uh, discuss later. And last but not least, uh, business interruption leading to monetary losses. Thanks, Antoine. You can continue with the next slide, please. Thank you, Anne. So now, after saying where do they come from, where, what is the source, uh, what's the type of damages, uh, i.e. what is the impact, um, financially speaking, of a claim? So the, the most obvious one is uh, I have a claim. I'm, they, they, we go to court and I lose, so I have to pay damages. So there's a financial impact that is uh, the prejudice that has that my that the claimant has suffered. If it does not go to court and there's a settlement agreement, then it's you know the settlement amount you're paying to your to your counterpart. But yeah, uh, the, the main one is to pay damages. Then you have legal costs, and first and foremost, you have your attorney's fees, uh, which, as you know, can be significant, especially if the dispute goes on and on for several years. Uh, we'll, we'll talk later about how long can a claim last, and what what intervention my um, what type of intervention my 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 lawyer can have, and, and the, the 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 substance of his intervention. But yeah, the, that can be quite significant. Uh, a source, well, a type of damage that uh, most people don't think about is the internal costs, i.e. the amount of, of time and effort that is spent internally to handle the claim. And depending on the type of claim, this can be very significant. Uh, even, even a simple claim that has to be discussed uh, repeatedly after board after board for even 15 minutes because the, the, the impact is significant and it has to be discussed. Even that at the board level will, will have some disruption effect uh, on, on the management. And then of course you have employees, if you have any employee in your structure, you have employees spending time, perhaps we'll discuss that again, but uh, perhaps helping uh, the attorneys to uh, build up defense to try to fetch the the available evidence and to have uh, discussions with your insurer with your attorney so th there's a lot of uh, internal cost that is in there then you have administrative fines uh, which can be quite significant too uh, for example you have uh, in, in the in the banking uh, law of uh, 1993 maximum maximum fine you can have I think is 250k uh, in the the the, the AML law uh, it's a million so administrative fines now they are more and more important because the, there's a tendency of the legislator to move away from criminal fines towards administrative fines so you have more and more administrative fines then you have criminal fines even though that you have less and less of them, you still have quite a lot of them. You can find them in, in various uh, laws uh, regulating the, the financial sector. You have them also in the Companies Act, uh, and you have them, of course, in the criminal code. And then the last type of damage, which is not financial, is reputational damage. That is reputational damage for your company, but also perhaps for you as a director. Um, and We'll, we'll discuss a bit also about the regulatory, regulatory impact for you as a director of a claim, uh, which goes a, a bit alongside the reputational damage because there's the fit and proper test. So it's not just reputational damage, it's also you, your career as a, as a professional, as a director uh, in Luxembourg in, a, in the professional sector. 
So first, as a director, how can I try to protect myself from claims? Um, the, the first one that is um, that we all repeat and repeat is when, when you accept a mandate, you have to know where you're going to and you have to, to conduct a due diligence exercise on the company before accepting a mandate. And once you're in the company, you have to ensure that the company follows good corporate governance rules. Of course, you're in a regulated sector, so there's a lot of regulations already uh, regulating all this, uh, the, 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 co the corporate governance side of things, especially regarding conflicts of interest and everything. But still, the, the, um, there are various ways to comply with those regulations. You can um, do it more or less seriously. Um, and also, those regulations do not cover all aspects of good corporate governance. So it's always best to, uh, to consider those aspects. Now, in, in more legal terms, uh, in terms of legal tools that you can use, you can, of course, and that is a must, you should seek to try to have your discharge voted at the uh, general uh, meeting of shareholders every year, but it has several limits. Sorry, first, I forgot to speak about the limit of due, carrying your own due diligence and ensuring good corporate governance. The limit, of course, is that you cannot anticipate everything and that we'll see, uh, especially during our discussion with Emmanuel, that it's not because you're doing things right that no, no claim will ever arise uh, against you. So it is, it is a must, but it's not sufficient. Same thing for the discharge. It's a um, must have, not only a nice to have, it's a must have, but it doesn't prevent uh, third party claims. It is granted only once a year. So you still have that uh, uh, Democles sword uh, every year. Will I get it? Will, will I not get it? It only covers facts which have been made uh, known to the shareholders so uh, if you if you if there's a spe specific transaction where you feel that maybe there's a risk and you know you don't request a specific discharge on the specific transaction maybe your discharge will not cover uh, that particular liability risk so you it, it's not uh, it's not completely bulletproof uh, and there's no guarantee that you'll receive it every year. So uh, when things go wrong, shareholders might be tempted to not grant discharge just in case, even though they're not launching any claim against you. Uh, and then, as I said, there's this, uh, this Democrat sword uh, above your head, which is probably not a very comfortable station to be in. A third tool, again, the legal one, is to try and seek indemnification by a third party, usually a shareholder or an entity above in the structure. Um, it is a great uh, tool, of course, but the main issue with that tool is the solvency of the, the, the person which is responsible to pay. Um, it's not because the entity who's giving you indemnification is above in the structure that it will be always solvent. Uh, and there are many ways for a company to more or less organize uh, insolvency. So, well, it's... It's, again, a great tool, but it's not completely bulletproof. And now I'm going to let Anne talk about, well, a product that is, of course, a bit more bulletproof, uh, although the, the, there's a price, but she, she, she will introduce you to all um, the available products, which can help you in that regard. Thank you, Antoine. Yes. How do I protect myself for claims? As an independent, independent director, of course, there is one first for policy, which is directors and officers liability. Um, I will discuss more in detail in the next slide, but this insurance policy protects personal, your personal liability and it covers all current, future, and past directors and offices. Um, independent directors, retired directors, outside directors as well. Um, I will uh, give you the definition of an officer in the next slide. Um, the second insurance policy is more for an, in, um, an entity. Uh, this is a professional ind indemnity, which covers the legal person and its um, employees against 
against um, claim, well, this covers claims against the, the entity. Um, this, um, there, there are specific, specific extensions for funds to comply with um, the CSSF 0277 secular or the IFM directive. The third insurance policy is cyber and it covers first response. The insurer will uh, mandate experts, advisors in legal services or IT and experts, experts in crisis management. Business interruption is also covered in, under cyber insurance policy and especially network interruption leading to financial losses. And last but not least, the liability is uh, also covered. Liability against, um, towards, sorry, third parties, multimedia liability, breach of personal or corporation information. Now there is another insurance policy, which name is fraud or crime. It, it depends on the insurance, uh, which covers employee dishonesty and third party fraud. Uh, when someone, either an employee or a third party, gives um, fraudulent instructions. Last but not least, there is an insurance policy which is not very known on the Luxembourg market, which is named um, Employment Practice Liability, and which covers um, directors and the, the entity for wrongful termination, discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation, defamation, invasion of privacy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and many other uh, um, things which are not listed here. Um, next slide, please, Antoine. Let's uh, focus on DNO, on the DNO policy we'll see what is covered and what is not covered. What is covered under this policy, which is in very important for directors and especially independent directors, personal li liability. Well, your personal assets may be at risk and you, um, you can be made you can be made re liable on your personal assets. Um, we can cover also, uh, well, all directors are covered, as I said further, um, two minutes ago, independent directors, but there are extensions for uh, retired directors, and sometimes insurers give, give a full life um, cover for retired directors. It's more and more often. What is a that an officer. This is not a director. An officer is someone who is a member of the management committee, someone who is a, a member of the general partner, someone who is a legal representative of, of a um, of a company. It, an officer is a de facto their director. And we can say also that an officer is an AML officer. Compliance officers are, uh, office, um, are um, covered under this policy. What is not covered? Here there is a typo. It is written international acts, but we should read intentional life acts. Someone who makes an act intentionally will not be covered. The proof must be given by the insurer, but anyway, if the, um, the insurer says, or a, if a, a court says that you made a, an international, intentional act, it will be not covered. Of course, money laundering will not be covered because it's illegal, as you may guess. USA ins uh, insured versus insured are not covered. Um, what is this? If um, there is an 
a director who comes from the US and says, uh, well, he wants to file a claim against another director. This is not covered because it's not, um, it, it, it's not legal, okay? Um, and last but not least, but known facts uh, before uh, a prior a claim or prior uh, the exemption date of the policy are not covered as well. And that's why we want to, uh, you to, to fill in forms to, um, well, when, when we want to subscribe a policy, we will have to file, um, uh, um, to fill in a form. And it's very important to fill in this form very consistently, because uh, if you say that there is no known facts, and maybe two or three months after the inception of the policy, you file a claim which was known prior to the, prior the inception, it will not be covered. So thank you, Anne. Um, thank you. Now what we've covered, then now that we've covered uh, the how, where do they come from? Now we're going to talk about when the birth, uh, the when the claim is born, and how we're going to react uh, once that is the case. So first, we're going to have a purely legal perspective on this, and well. First, there's no real definition of what a claim is. Um, a cl well, from a, from a purely legal perspective, from an insurance perspective, there, there's more clarity on this. But uh, when you have someone requesting something for you and who might be uh, willing to go to court for it, that could be a way of putting it. Um, but unless you receive an assignation, a writ of summons, uh, you, it's not really clear when uh, when you have a claim. Um, sometimes a mere request can degenerate and, and turn into um, uh, a big claim. It, it's not it's not clear legally speaking. But something that must be kept in mind is that well, although there's no pre-action conduct rules in Luxembourg, there's still a necessity to react. Pre-action conduct rules. Um, if you come from a common law uh, background. Uh, it's something that you that that is that you have in mind, and it's um, even well before parties go to court, they they have to follow certain uh, pre-action conduct uh, rules, and they have to exchange. They may have to exchange evidence, argumentation, um, even before they can go to court. In Luxembourg, you have none of this. So, in theory, in pure theory, if facing a claim, you can just not respond or you can just deny it, or uh, you can challenge it, you, you have liberty. But then th there's quite a lot of exceptions to that. First, it's always better to challenge or to respond a claim as soon as possible, especially because of the facture or correspondence accepted principles. Uh, it's two principles that are quite specific to uh, Belgium and Luxembourg law that you do not find for example, in French or uh, I think in, in English law, but between traders, i.e. between uh, companies, commercial companies, uh, uh, if you have an invoice that is not challenged within a certain time, it will be deemed to have been accepted. Same thing, if you have a statement that is made in a claim, for example, against a, com against a commercial company and that commercial company does not challenge it, there's the risk that the statement that has been made will be deemed as having been accepted by that commercial company. So it's really, really important to challenge claims that are made against you. Another thing is that if you don't challenge a claim that is made against you, it would be very easy for the claimant to go before a judge and say, look, I've made this claim, it is not challenged, please give me a provisional order, and it will be an enforceable one. And then it will be, you will have to take the initiative to challenge that order, which will be enforceable until you manage to set it aside. So you're kind of losing the advantage in litigation. Also, thinking of a claim that once you have a claim thinking, 
strategically from the beginning is very important because if you don't respond to your claim or if you don't think about strategy right from the start you may be a bit naive in your how you approach the correspond your exchanges with the claimant so you might be willing to adopt a purely uh, commercial approach but if you don't find a commercial agreement then maybe in your correspondence you will have statements admissions of, of liability somewhere just because you've been a bit a bit too nice a bit too commercial so it's really important to be strategic right from the start from a insurance perspective again first legally speaking purely then uh, i will let Anne uh, respond to how in practice uh, things work but from legally speaking purely it is sufficient that the damage arises during the life of the policy uh, the timing of the claim that you file with the insurer is a priori not relevant there is a small exception in the law your policy can provide that the, the the claim you're filing with the insurer must be filed within three years as from the when the damage has arisen but th that that should be specified in your policy if that's the case um so legally purely legally speaking there is no threshold for when to react and contact your insurer but Anne will tell you what it what why it's best to to do it very quickly thanks Antoine yeah sure when to file a claim I would say as soon as you have a circumstance which you might potentially lead to a claim we can have a discussion together or you can have a discussion with your broker or or your insurer just to explain what happened and prepare a um, conservatory basis a declaration file or the second um, possibility is that you received a written notice. What is a written notice? It can be a summon, it can be a letter from a third party saying that you made a wrongful act. But anyway, an insurer will pay only if the four following certain conditions are met. First, we need a written notice. Secondly, an error must be made by the insured. If there is no error, there is no cover. Thirdly, there must be a financial loss claimed by a third party with a figure. And last but not least, there must be a causal link between the error and the damage. If these conditions are not met, the insurer will potentially not want to cover or, well, not pay anyway, and will ask many, many questions. When will the insurer begin to pay for defense, defense costs? Under a DNO policy, there is no deductible. I would say no deductible if the claim arises in Europe. If the claim is made in the USA or in Canada, there is always, there is always a deductible because as you know, uh, defense costs are much higher in these countries. Um, under a DNO policy, defense costs will be paid by the insurer as from the beginning um, with the first invoice. With a professional indemnity policy, there is always a deductible and the, um, the insurer will pay as soon as the deductible is exhausted. Deductible, we can say also retention. This retention is for the insured. This is the amount that the insured must be pay himself or herself. Sometimes policies have pre-claim costs clauses. What is it? This is a clause which says that you have no um, a knowledge of a circumstance which could lead to a claim, and you want to um, make mitigation costs, and you can discuss this with a lawyer, and the insurer will say, "Okay, I will pay for that, even in the if even if there is no written notice, even if." 
all the four uh, conditions above mentioned are not met for the time being. This is just to mitigate the costs of a potential claim. But this is a clause which is not always written in policies. So we must be careful when we uh, set up insurance contracts. To whom will the insurer pay defense costs? Either directly to the lawyer or to the insured who has already paid the lawyer. It depends on how the insured wants to handle or how the insurer prefers to, to handle. Okay. The bill for a claim. When to react? First of all, you should contact your insurer or your broker. If you have a broker, please give a call to your broker, explain what arose and find a solution with him or her. Um, I would say just give the, him or her all the information you have, all the information you uh, you met, uh, this, a description of the claim or the circumstance, the nature of the alleged or potential damage, the names of the actual or potential, potential claimants, and the date and manner in which the company or insured persons, as the case may be, first became aware of the claim of cir circumstance. This is really important, this date. And um, after that, you will decide if you file a claim or if you file a claim on a conservatory basis. Conservatory, this is when you have no written notice, no um, um, figures claimed, and no uh, information, no, no um, sorry, uh, wrongful act uh, described against you. Okay, maybe it's your turn, Antoine, as an attorney. Yeah. So, well, another thing that you should consider, I don't say that you, it's, you always need to do it, but you should definitely consider it, is to contact your attorneys. Uh, what will uh, we do for you? Um, first, one, one thing that is sometimes overlooked is they will help you negotiate with the opposing party, not because they have amazing negotiating skills, but one key aspect is that uh, negotiations between attorneys are strictly confidential. They will, they're, they're privileged. And then, so you, you have a legal privilege that is attached to those exchanges, which is much more easy, much easier uh, and stronger than a confidentiality agreement um, that you, you you would set up uh, just for uh, negotiating purposes. So just having an attorney eases the negotiation process. Of course, they will establish, help you establish strategy for the case. Strategy is important, not just when you have a writ of summons uh, served to you, but way ahead. Uh, you need to think ahead about maybe trying to, to, to see what evidence is available, what evidence you can try to produce, you can start producing some paper trail that will help you uh, down, down the line uh, during litigation. They will also help you estimate your chances of success. So that may be helpful also uh, in your relationship with the insurer. Uh, the, your insurer will perhaps uh, cover the, the legal fees for a, a risk assessment because as Anne said, it is uh, in the best of in, in best interest of everyone because it helps you mitigate the costs uh, that the claim um, will generate. Also, will give you an indication on the likely time and costs of litigation if there is a possible litigation, uh, which is a key element to take into consideration when also thinking about uh, negotiating a settlement. Uh, and well. If litigation arises, they will help you navigate the proceedings and, of course, uh, represent you before the courts. So we can go to the next slide. Now, the life of a claim. Um, so you should uh, distinguish three phases. The first one is pre-litigation, then you have litigation, and then you have enforcement. Litigation is when you have a writ of summons that is served on a party. All that happens beforehand is pre-litigation. Pre-litigation can also involve 
uh, claims being made uh, in front of the CSSF, uh, where the CSSF will, you know, uh, ask you to take position. Um, and so it, it it is vast. It can be from uh, there's not even a dispute yet, but you anticipate that there's a risk to exchanges with the CSSF following a. a, a, a uh, a claim filed by uh, one of your customer or investor. Uh, and then you have the all whole enforcement phase that is sometimes that again uh, overlooked, which once you have a judgment, even if it's final and enforceable, you still have to enforce it. So if you're a claimant or uh, that is that can be a hassle. If you're a defendant, that gives you extra time. Uh, but enforcement can take as much as long as the litigation phase. So just purely on the litigation phase, there's no uh, standard duration. Um, I've seen litigation that lasts for 15, 20 years. Um, and well, they, they, they last so long because they are, it can be for various factors. There can be an expertise mission that is ordered, uh, which would, that, that is likely to be the case in math calculation errors. Uh, there can be, um, several parties, uh, if there are more than four or five parties and if part, each party has to file their own submissions and have their own lawyer, uh, the, the, the submission exchange process will take uh, forever. There can be procedural um, orders that are uh, that come before the, the judgment on the merits. So if you have a criminal complaint, uh, for example, that 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 is launched, maybe the, the the commercial judge will say, okay, we have to wait for the end of the criminal uh, procedure uh, before we can resume the commercial um, procedure. So for these reasons, yeah, it's not it's not unheard of to have claims that last for twenty years. While a very very pure vanilla dispute will typically last between one and three years for first instance proceedings and maybe one and two years for appeal proceedings. But that's really when you have two parties, maybe three parties, uh, and you have no uh, procedural oddity that, that, will, um, that will make the, the, the claim last much longer. So just so you have it in mind, uh, a claim is going to potentially impact a company for at least two, three, four years. Um, just to give you a broad idea. If, of course, the claim goes to litigation. If it's not, then, well, it all depends on the duration of the negotiation process. Next slide, please. Now, what is the impact for you as a director, but also for your business um, of a claim? So first, in terms of efforts, I talked before about internal costs, i.e. the time and effort you're going to put in as a litigant or as a as a defendant to to fight this claim, or even to negotiate uh, in the context of that claim. So, of course, I'm talking here about only Luxembourg litigation, but in Luxembourg, parties have quite a limited role in litigation if they are represented by a counsel. Uh, they're, for example, not required to appear in court personally to correspond with the court or the other party. They're not required to testify and and except in exceptional circumstances. So if they have a counsel, they can really rely on their counsel, on their, on their attorney. However, they will have a key role in helping, helping their attorney because they need to collect the evidence that is available, of course, to give some factual background, also some business insight about why the, the transaction that went wrong or something uh, similar. Uh, to have ba background on the relationship with the claimant. So the, even though there's a limited procedural role of uh, a defendant, there's still quite a lot of effort to be put in just for uh, being in best position to defend your claim. There's also a legal impact of a claim. For example, you, you will have a regulatory impact. There may be disclosure obligations, especially if you're uh, in, the, in the financial sector, you might have to disclose the existence of a claim to the CSF. Um, the existence of a claim, you, 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 you may have also to disclose it as a director personally in the context of the fit and proper test, uh, because they will want to, to know whether you're, you, you're a party to, to your claim. Um, also, the existence of a claim can qualify as 
inside information if you're subject to market abuse regulation or to, um, to certain market rules. Also, the existence of a claim might have to be um, to be reported in the management report, and it might uh, be uh, uh, well. The, you, you will have to consider provisions for risk if there's a claim against you, and you will have to liaise with your auditors to give them the necessary elements for them to 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 determine whether a provision is necessary or not. So there will be also a, a direct and immediate financial impact of a claim. That is the provision for risk. Next slide, please. So I talked about previously the, the different uh, sources of damages and the, 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 the legal costs being one of them, but I wanted to go into a bit more detail there, uh, specifically about litigation. So you have the damages, i.e. the damages that you'll be ordered to pay if you lose the case. There's the procedural costs. Procedural costs, is a small amount that you have to pay to the other party if you lose. Uh, it is not very significant, and it, well, the, the, the rules to calculate it are very obscure, and only lawyers <laughs> know about it. But usually, the amount is very um, is very nominal. Uh, you have a procedural indemnity, which is an amount that you have to pay. Usually, if you lose, it's not really always the case, but most often when you lose, you have to pay the other party a procedural indemnity, which is on top of the procedural costs and which is uh, set very discretionally by the judge. Again, the amount is quite nominal. For, for a typical first instance, it's, it's very rare to see procedural indemnity going above 2K or 3K. Uh, if, if, and uh, the amount can double if you go to, to appeal proceedings. Uh, sometimes the amount will be as low as 500 euros. Then you have translation costs. Uh, if, you're in an, in ten, if your dispute has an international element to it, it's very likely that some documents will be, um, will be not in a language that, a judicial language. There's a great uh, thing in Luxembourg is that the judges, I think they all, with no exception, but perhaps there will be one exception one day, but they all accept uh, evidence in English. So that, that, that is great news, even though it's not contemplated by, by our rules. As long as the judge understands uh, the, the language and assuming that the parties also understand the language, um, there will, will be no need to translate. Uh, English documents into French, German, or Luxembourgish, which are the, the, the free languages that uh, official languages. Then you have experts fees. If you have an expertise mission uh, that is ordered by the courts, uh, the, usually the loser will have to pay for the fees of the experts. Usually it's the person who requests the expertise mission that will have to make advance payments to, to the experts. Uh, but also the court can just decide to, to say that those pre-payments must be shared equally between the parties or with some 60-40 uh, um, uh, repartition. Then you have, well, the council's fees, the attorney's fees, which was discussed. Luxembourg is not the most expensive place to litigate in. It's actually quite a cheap place, I think, to, to litigate in, but the amounts uh, can, can seem uh, and can be sometimes very significant, especially if uh, your, uh, your dispute goes on and on for several years. Uh, then you can think about other consultants' fees. Um, sometimes a dispute will require you to hire your own consultant for giving specific expertise advice that may help uh, for the, the, your case be before the courts. Um, and then there's the internal cost, i.e. the time the time and effort you spent internally to defend your case. So it, the, the amount in total can be quite uh, important. And now we're gonna talk about real life uh, experience and thank you, Emmanuel, for being uh, so patient. And we'll, we'll, we'll dive in uh, a bit more into concretely how uh, as a director you're gonna you're likely to face a claim and trying to have some good uh, tips and tricks from Emmanuel um, from his experience. So Emmanuel, thank you uh, 
Thank you very much. A first question for you. Um, so you've been involved in uh, several claims during your professional life. In your experience, how do they arise? Is it a quick and unexpected process or a slow deterioration process? Well, first, thank you for inviting me to, to share a bit of my uh, almost 23 years of experience with uh, dealing with claims and uh, dealing with um, insurers. Um, claims arise both ways. It can be very quick and unexpected. And I would take the example of an calculation error, which is discovered after a um, certain period. Or they can come up with as part of a lengthy process where the um, situation is slowly deteriorating itself. So there's there's no real there is no real um, rule on that. The only thing is that um, when the situation is deteriorating, you usually have a um, an exchange of emails. Uh, complaining about the quality of your services, for example, and forgot to mention that my experience does not only cover my role as independent director, but also my former role as uh, head of central administration and, and our other businesses. Um, you first have phone calls, meetings, um, exchanges of emails before you actually receive a formal uh, letter. And this ties to at least for the um, companies that are supervised by the CSSF and which are part of the financial industry, the ties into your claims handling procedures. What and how you define a claim. Is an, is an email asking for uh, clarification on, I know, a monthly reporting of the fund, is that a claim or is that an inquiry? Do you find that as a claim or complaint or is that a, just a question? So there's the importance of the definition of a of a complaint first, and then whether you qualify a complaint as a claim, whether it could potentially lead to um, financial losses or reputational losses, um, additional work, damages, and so on, as we discussed previously in in, in the discussion. Have you do you experience a, a, a shift of mindset from all oh, this an inquiry? So I have this specific mindset about trying to deal with that inquiry. And then suddenly in your, well, I, I assume the board collectively uh, says, okay, that now this is a claim and you see a shift of mindset completely. I don't think there's been a huge shift of mindset and in, in, in the last years. Um, the, the queries relate to the same and well, if you take in, into funds, for example, or wealth management industry, it often ties with poor financial performance. Uh, but there's, there's nothing new here, in my opinion, um, in terms of inquiries and potential claims. And I think that demonstrating a wrong management or bad management of a portfolio or, or a fund is presumably something that is one of the most difficult things to prove injustice. Um, this, being, this being said, um, in the case of deteriorating um, relationships, well, you, you could take the example of late filing of annual reports of uh, investment funds which are supervised by the CSSF, where you receive a first reminder, then usually after a given period, you receive a second reminder, and you know that after the second reminder, you would have the fine as a third and final reminder. Mm. So there's a shift in the magnitude and number of um, fines imposed by uh, by the regulator. That's something which is much more recent. Okay. Uh, another question for you, Emmanuel. What is the impact for a director, but in, in personal terms, of a claim? Well, the first thing when you receive a a formal complaint that you qualify as a claim, uh, that you ask yourself, okay, what, what have I done wrong? Inevitably. And I can give you several examples of that, um, including a personal one. Um, um, 
I, I, I will give this example because I was traveling to, to Paris to, to visit a prospective client. And I, when, when I got out of the tube, and I didn't, um, I didn't um, disable that when we prepared the call, but it's, uh, it's something which is, in my view, very illustrative of the personal impact. And I received a phone call from the police um, saying, Mr. Bigger, we want to see you. Uh, I replied, okay, is this problematic? And they replied, no, if it was really problematic, we would have come to your home at six in the morning. So when can you be available? Well, I'm currently traveling, uh, maybe tomorrow morning at nine. So I can tell you that during the whole day, I asked myself, okay, what happened? What have I done wrong? Because obviously the police cannot disclose anything on the phone until they have verified your identity. I hardly slept that night. And it turned out simply that someone had committed a fraud um, and the phone number communicated by uh, the victim of that fraud um, was actually corresponding to the SIM, to the phone number of, of the SIM card of my iPad. So they actually just wanted to check whether I was completely out of thing. But I mean, believe me, it turned the whole, the whole, the whole night along and I hardly slept. But I think the first thing is when you receive a claim uh, that you say, okay, what did I, what did I do wrong? What did I miss as a director? What should I have seen? So you're actually in a very emotive and very emotional uh, stance. Yeah, well, I, I can testify myself having discussed with uh, directors and um, about this subject and it's, it's hard to realize before it happens to you that you can be brought in, brought in a litigation having done nothing wrong. Perhaps you'll be brought in for enforceability reasons. For example, if you try to, if you're seeking the annulment of a of a board decision, you, you'll have to 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 issue a rate of summons against all directors. Uh, so it, perhaps it will just be a procedural question. Sometimes it will just be for strategic purposes to try to in, increase pressure on the directors of the of the defendant. And sometimes you've done nothing wrong, and still you have a bailiff that can, that comes to your place uh, at nine a.m. to to the, deliver to serve you a writ of summons. And I guess until your unless you until you read it fully and you've taken advice from from a, an attorney saying, look, there's no risk. Don't worry. Uh, it's going to be a, a litigation process. It's going to be a bit slow, and uh, we understand that it can be painful. But don't worry; uh, you, the, the the impact, the liability risk for you is very low. Even then, you still have that day or two where, obviously, um, receiving a writ of summons uh, and having bailiff come to your ass is a huge source of stress. I fully concur. I fully concur with you. And the first thing. I think that one of the first things that comes across is really stress and stress management. Um, so as, as a recipient of, of the claim, one should really uh, breath out, first thing. And my very strong piece of advice is to immediately liaise with the insurance broker and with a legal advisor specialized in litigation in order to, to push the emotion away um, from you. Because yeah. I, think, I think that when you're under stress, even, even though you're quite experienced and um, when you're under stress and potentially extreme stress, because as you said before, um, you might receive claims that um, are actually targeting your personal wealth. Um, when one of your clients has not paid um, its taxes, you might receive a nice letter from the tax authorities in Luxembourg asking you as a director to solely they really pay for the um, for the taxes due. And um, then you are under extreme stress. And therefore, I think you need really good advice in order to, to manage the, the stressful situation and to avoid um, acceding to panic or doing things which could prove to be very detrimental, especially in litigation, in, in a pre-litigation phase. So we've already discussed about a few unpleasant moments. So you discussed well, having to go to the police, I discussed having a baby come to, you, come to your place. 
but uh, any any other examples? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, I think I, I will have enough uh, stories to tell to write a book one day. Um, but it's true that um, well, I can I can cite um, maybe two other two other examples. One was a um, another error that takes back now while it's prescribed. So I will not disclose the names, but a, a nav error that we discovered um, whereas uh, the financial statements had already been audited and approved um, and so on and so forth. So we discovered a error in the performance fee computation, which impacts who actually was representing something like 70, 80% of the bank's own funds. Um, so when this, this arose, uh, when when this was discovered, obviously, uh, I was wondering whether I would uh, I would have to sack all all the employees I was responsible for. So this added another another layer of stress plus the other departments of the bank. Um, all in all, it turned out well because we managed to have almost all parties concerned uh, paid to the pot. So not only the uh, the insurance company. Um, but also the portfolio manager, because the portfolio manager should have checked the performance fee, which they did not, and they should have spotted this uh, this issue. We also managed to have the um, auditor pay, because they should uh, they should also have checked it. And in spite of the EV uh, general conditions that were already prevailing at the time, um, the engagement manager did recognize in the first meeting that they should have spotted it. So they did not they, they did not pay much, but they accepted in in a commercial terms to pay about one year of audit fees. And all in all, everything went went back into into normal situation. But obviously, there you were well. The, the team did spend a very significant amount of time in um, recomputing the net asset value because there were a huge number of subscriptions and redemptions. So the internal costs were extremely high. And I think at the time, I'm not sure whether internal costs were, were covered. I'm talking about more than 20 years ago. Um, plus we audit fees, plus compensation, plus and so on and so forth. That's uh, maybe one example. Um, another example of stressful situation is, is when you have the uh, receptionist of your office uh, calling you at nine in the morning and telling, um, remember I got the police judiciaire at the reception. They want to see you. Ah, okay. How many are they? Well, there are nine. So thanks. Thankfully, it was not the first visit of the police judiciary I had in my life. So I immediately told her, look, uh, book the uh, the large meeting room for the entire day, uh, care for sandwiches at lunchtime. And if at six, I'm not out of the building, this is the phone number of a friend of mine who's a, who's a lawyer. Please call him. Yeah, well, in that respect, I would I would advise that you contact your lawyer during <laughs> during the downgrade process because there, there's a well there, there, there's a lot to do. It's a full day, as you said. You're in inferiority. You're one against nine person, and uh, I think we share a common experience is that the, the police officer actually showed his gun during the whole process <laughs> for intimidation yeah. purposes, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so yeah, it's it, it it's perhaps one of the most in intimidating moment of course uh, now I have... I, yeah this, this uh, if i may add something i think that um it could be it could be interesting for for directors to be trained in um, interview techniques and replying to this kind of, of stress because it can come out of nowhere on the, on that one on the on the visit of the police judiciary um well first they left on my on my desktop they left a copy of all documents that they took all documents, all, all emails that they copied and so on. And I still have this uh, folder called police. Um, but at the end, they said, okay, you've done your, your diligence and you have absolutely no means of knowing. Because this came from a, uh, a rogatory commission coming from another European country. And obviously, well, we did, I did not have any means to know what happened in that country. And this is something that we already tackled before in in the presentation. Yeah, obviously, yeah. So, in, in the interview process is very stressful, and what well, we we tend to it's a good thing to be to have even many lawyers with you because one can brief the next interviewee uh, while the first person is being interviewed, 
and we can brief on what to do, what they have to say, how the extent to which they have to cooperate. It's best to be trained ahead, of course, uh, but uh, it's something that we do also is uh, arriving as soon as possible. It's a good thing that uh, the Luxembourg police tends to arrive at nine and not at 6 a.m. I think the law allows them to arrive at, to arrive very early, but usually they arrive at nine. So that gives you a bit more time to organize yourself. But um, well, 6, 6 a.m. it would be directly at home. <laughs> <laughs> so now a question for, for you, Anne. Uh, do you have any tips for directors on how to best protect uh, their position? Yes, Antoine, I have two tips. First of all, subscribe a DNO policy or even more a DNO PI combined, that means directors and officers plus professional indemnity insurance policy combined because there is a gray line between both coverages. And secondly, be transparent with your broker or your insurer, because if you, um, if you keep important things for yourself and don't share it with the insurer, maybe it could be uh, damageable for you as a director. And the on the other side of the spectrum, do you have, uh, what's in, in your view, the worst thing an insured person can do to prejudice his own case? Yes, uh, a director or a, uh, an entity should not acknowledge his or her liability in writing before obtaining the agreement of the insurer. This is really important. The insurer or the, the lawyer. Yeah, I, I think this resonates with um, adopting a strategic mindset quite early and not being too naive in thinking that, okay, this is purely commercial. Yeah. purely commercial issue so we'll deal it very commercially it um you can remain uh, commercial in your approach to negotiation but it's mm -hmm. also good to have that that legal mindset in mind because you don't want to prejudice your case yeah. um, too much well now we have some uh one uh, we've replied to many questions uh, during the the course of our presentation but we have a couple of uh, questions so i think emmanuel um you've already indicated that you'd like to respond to how is a compliance officer protected from liability? No, I think I already responded. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, it, so it, it is covered under, well, a compliance officer or even an RC in, in the funds industry is usually covered under the definition of officer in the, uh, in the policy. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Because I, I've seen some questions that uh, have been... Uh, written in, which I think have been answered and are no longer in the Q&A list. Uh, I see it's time to take up yoga, if not already. Uh, Emmanuel, <laughs> uh, do you do a lot of yoga? <laughs> well, yoga or relaxation techniques or meditation, I'm not sure whether Jane is making reference to, um, to, to specific situations or to the fact that in any case, I think that the life of an independent non-executive director is rather stressful to to say the truth, so, so it can be sports, it can be yoga, it can be hiking, it can be mountain biking, it can be tennis, whatever. Um, and I think that, uh, yes, it's important to to come to those um, stressful situations the best prepared possible. Thank you. I see that, yeah, Anne, please go. Yes, I would like to answer Christine's question. Is it envisageable that the company covers its director for insurance or do you recommend each director to have its own insurance? Well, as a director, there are two ways to insure yourself, your liability. Either you are an independent director acting on your behalf or you have your own entity. You can have a policy, a DNO policy covering all your mandates, all your directorships. And the second way to cover uh, directors is that the, um, the entity um, subscribes an insurance policy, a DNO in a policy. And this DNO will cover all the directors, even 
um, independent directs. I think I'm clear enough. Yeah, so maybe something on this. When it's a group DNO policy and you're a director and you want to make sure that you, you'll be protected by it, you need to be particularly be diligent and you need to, of course, be able to review the policy uh, to receive a copy of it, you need to, to read it or have someone uh, review it. Uh, you need to take into consideration certain limits in terms of uh, amounts that are negotiated at the group level and that could impact you ultimately if you're um, uh, your, your own liability. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's not the same thing. It's, uh, yes. it's not the same thing. For NEDS, there is um, a tip which I would give directors before accepting the mandate. Please ask if the, um, the group has a policy and just to protect yourself, ask for a DNO, a DNO to cover you. Yeah, I wanted to add that in some cases, the group insurance policy might be in a language that you do not 100% master yes. or under law that you do not 100% um, master. I mean, personally, I'm not an expert in common law, which is um, UK based law. So when I have a UK group insurance policy, I tend to look at it once, then only once. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Finally, and and a, in any case, in any case, it's so I think it is always good to have your own insurance policy um, because this one would come second in rank. So you can you can potentially negotiate terms with your with your insurance company whereby your retention corresponds to the maximum insured amount in your client's common well in your common client's policies mm -hmm. when it would it would cost less. That's why it's um, a good uh, idea to have it, it, your own policy. There is a, another question. Hi, do you have some names of insurance companies to propose DNO insurance? Uh, many of them propose in DNO insurances, but all are not the best ones. So. I would suggest Raphael to contact me if he needs an ADNO insurance because uh, it depends on your type of activity. It depends on many uh, parameters. And some insurers are better than others. Um, when a broker makes a tender on the market, he or her, he or she asks for different um, offers and he or she should uh, make a comparison of all the offers and give recommendations to the prospect. This is um, what I do every, every time I have a request. Great, but I think that concludes what that, that, that was the, the last question. If you have questions that come up uh, in your mind after this uh, webinar, you can, of course, send us an email. Um, would be perhaps happy to uh, insert them in writing, or maybe that would be the subject of a next webinar that uh, we can do. In any case, many thanks uh, for your participation. Stefan, I don't know if you have any closing words, or Emmanuel uh, and Anne, if you have any no, we, words. We, we have another question, which I think uh, yeah. mm, yes. is directed to Anne. Yes. To what okay. extent are fines covered by DNO policies? Well, first of all, um, this is a, an extension which exists on the market for um, several years. First of all, we have to uh, check if it's uh, an ancient, an old policy or a new policy, because old policies don't have this extension and uh, new policies should have this extension. Well, the insurers with whom I work have this extension. And what is what do you what do we um, mean by fines? A fine uh, can be an administrative fine or a fine coming from a regulator like uh, CSSF 
that's why uh, um, we should have this um, extension 0277 uh, subscribed for funds, for, for example, for, for an, as an example. Do we have statistics of claims in Luxembourg? Magnitude breakdown by candle entity. Well, this is uh, these are questions yeah. very particular, and I don't have enough time here to answer these questions. And it could be uh, another uh, the subject of another um, webinar or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, really thanks a lot, Anne, Emmanuel, and Antoine for sharing your insights, those great examples. As you just said, uh, we have appetite for more such sessions. I think the questions were also very nice. We will mm -hmm. uh, pimp up, uh, let's say, the recording in order to make it accessible to our members as usual. And uh, again, thanks a lot for joining our common event. Thank you for your attention and invitation. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you.